One. And we are recording. Hello, everybody. I'm Devin. I'm here with my good friend, Sam Morris. Uh, we have been talking a little bit, and we wanted to start recording because I think we started to get onto something that's really interesting. Um, Sam, you could, you could uh, tell me again the, um, I just got you know, uh, uh, the, the quote that kind of started the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, my brother told me something really interesting once, and Devin, I bring it up because Devin and I both are creative guys, and we both like creative, and we both uh, derive energy from that process, and my brother is the same way, and he once told me, like, in terms of content creation, like, don't cook the meal that you want to cook, cook the meal that people want to eat, like, give people what they want. Um, I think that's hyper, that's been hyper relevant in my career so far, um, in just, like, understanding who my audience is, and trying to serve up the best thing that I know that will be relatable to them. And there's a lot of times where like, I wanna make, you know, organic souffle made out of seaweed or whatever the fuck, like, but uh, they want hamburgers and hot dogs. And, you know, unfortunately, even if hamburgers and hot dogs seem boring to me, sometimes that's important to, to serve up with my audience in mind. I don't know, like, like how do you think that, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that, Doug? Yeah, I mean, with respect, I wholeheartedly disagree. I heard a great one that I think is a good way of refuting it, and it was, and this was a, a quote by Henry Ford, and he said, if I would have asked the people what they want, they would have said faster horses. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and I, I'm not going to go off on some crazy tangent, but, but the way that I conceptualize that, at, the, at least at this juncture in my life, is there's kind of two operations that I can choose to go from like a, from like a mathematical standpoint. I can integrate. That is to say, I can like take away my eccentricities to be more part of the herd and I can make my offerings more palatable and, and rounder on the edges and so forth, or I can differentiate. And yeah. I can go farther into what genuinely intrigues me and farther into the esoteric and farther into what gives me light and life. And, and I, I, I get that there's an interesting discussion to be had because it's like what will sell better or what will get more popular acclaim, but like I just feel more driven to the to the thing that gives me passion. Like if I make a thing that I like, at least one person's gonna like it. Yeah. Well the sweet spot seems to be where you can pursue your passion, you can lean in your creativity and your eccentricities, but also find that golden, that Goldilocks zone where it actually applies to people and is relatable to people as well. And right. I feel you. Because I've, no. I feel you. I feel you. Like, not to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Oh, no, please. Go ahead. Just because, like, I, I, you know, as much as I say that and I think it's like, oh, you know, fucking Trump card, like, do your shit, you know, and don't pander. I think that there is, a, there is an argument to be made against going too far into the um, creative space, let's call it, like, uh, I, I, this is a little bit of a non sequitur, but it makes the point. I happen to be of the opinion that the, the truest creatives, the, the, the most genius amongst us in history have been the ones that have gone through madness. Because I think that there's a, I mean, that's a long, that's a long explanation, but, but I do believe that. And so I think that there needs to be, again, like one step back to, you know, the, 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 the village and yet still having that one step in, in the, in the cave, you know, in the dark, in the, in the, in the deep. And, well, it's good, and yeah, it's good to take a swim in the ocean and then be able to come out the other side and tell people about what you've experienced. Right. 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 And, and staying in the ocean, let's say is, is not relatable is not, you can't, you know, nobody can reach a person that's in, in, you know, flights of fan, fancy uh, or fantasy or what have you. So yeah, I, I, I understand the point and that's definitely been a sticking point or a, or a stumbling block in my life because I think I kind of blasted off from the former to the latter in my, in my college years. Smoked a lot of pot, did a lot of surfing, did a lot of thinking, did a lot of growing, did a lot of self-destructive Let yourself years. drift a little far. I'm sorry? You let yourself drift a little too far? I, I did, I did. And I drifted so far that I didn't know, I, like, like the, the shore didn't, uh, didn't look familiar anymore. You know, like, like I didn't, I didn't know how to swim back. And like, it's only been through years of integrating myself back into what I feel is like a good version of myself and so forth that I've been able to kind of make good on my craziness, if you like. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting conversation to have because I think that all, all artists strive to have that, that creative flow and that like, re how would you say like um, relationship with the muse? I've heard it, I've heard it 
you know, symbolically. And, and uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to like be, you know, you don't want to get taken by that, right? You don't want to be possessed by that, but, but also there has to be some kind of avenue there for creative input. So I hear you, I hear you. And, and I, I suppose there's an argument to be made for both. And, and I think the balance is the most important, yeah? Let me ask you this. I mean, without diving into like the whole biography, when you, when you came back after drifting really far and you came back, did you, you said like, I think the way you said it just now was you didn't recognize the shore, but at this phase in your life, do you think you've been able to reconnect with the young man you were before that entirely? For like, sure, for what sure. Was that, what was that process like? You don't. Yeah. Don't on the spot, uh, feel free to pass. No, it. no, 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 not at all. Um, I mean, a lot of it comes through the loves that I've had since being a boy. You know, if I, we had a pool in my backyard when my parents were together, when I, you know, I when I was a little boy in, in Carlton Avenue in Los Gatos. And that to this day, like I literally went and swam at the at the pool at my dad's, you know, home. Uh, my wife and I are here before we're moving to Oregon. And I have, I'm 33 years old. I have the same exact feeling that I had when I was, you know, five swimming, you know. So, so that's never changed. All of the psychological bullshit and mental maps that I've built, you know, and all that crap, all, you know, conditioning or what have you, doesn't touch that doesn't doesn't have any jurisdiction in those those primal feelings and so part of kind of coming back to myself if you like was rediscovering I, I kind of never lost those things to be fair because I surfed all through that time but mm. but staying grounded in what makes me genuinely feel that kind of acceptance and loving you know wholeness inside myself is what is what brought me back to you know the individuals of my family is what allowed me to see my relationships in a different light and and you know not in this like I've constantly been persecuted thing that I think is easy to fall into and and actually where I felt like wow like I've done a lot of things that have been shitty to people and I haven't really taken stock of of all of the sacrifices that people have made for me and so on and so forth so kind of going into like just craziness took me away from obviously all of those like relevant recognitions but but then just kind of coming back to being able to feel good inside of me and then being able to look at the other people that have been close to me in my whole life and 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 realize at once that they all just wanted me to be okay yeah. and like i was kind of just i was just banging into the walls of that and like nobody was really doing that to me i was just kind of i was kind of manifesting situations that people needed to handle for me and then i resented that that's that was that was kind of I mean in short you know like I could talk for hours about it but but in in so many words that's kind of a, a, a roadmap I, I went down I, I caused a lot of turmoil between myself and others I kind of I kind of kept connected to something that that was deeply like inside of me and then it allowed me to from what I had gained through all of that reapproach the like terrestrial the the terrain the, the 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 like the like familial terrain specifically with like more grace and like with more like acceptance of myself as because i think a lot of it was not to keep going i apologize but but i'll just say this a lot of it was that i didn't accept myself and i blamed people for that mm. that was a real foundational problem that i had to deal with um and yeah there's no real short way of describing how how I, how, you know, I was able to do that. I'm sorry. Well, it's a daily struggle, just accepting yourself and, and liking what you see in the mirror. Not to be too depressing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think, I think it's, I, I think it's, I think it's more like, I would disagree with that slightly. Not to say that it, that's not true. I sure. Well, it's a personal thing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, I that's fair for I sure. Would, night, I would argue a lot of people feel that way. But. I, I, I hear you. I, I just think that, I, I saw the mountaintop. I saw that there is a way of being where nobody could touch that place of self-acceptance. I'm not saying that I've held that every moment of my life, but I saw that that's possible. And, right. and seeing that that's a possible thing, I realized why the fuck aren't I doing that all the time? Why would anybody in good faith allow themselves to give their power away? And, and I kind of just, that just hit me, dude. 
it hit me at one point and then it made me super it, like specifics i think it'll be helpful because like yeah uh, I'm, I'm getting lost in the metaphor here what do you mean i mean once i saw the depth of my own power like like interpersonally and and like spiritually let's say and not in some weird like woo woo like i'm a healer and like look at my crystals way but like in a way of like no like i'm i'm genuinely okay with who i am people in their crystals man no and i love crystals don't get me wrong i, I, I have a degree in earth sciences and geology so like I, i'm not even being facetious like I, crystals are awesome but but like i i got to a place where i understood like i saw the light of total self-acceptance and it changed everything everything changed after that nothing was the same everything that the, the shore was a different shore after that because yeah. i was no i was no longer my story i was no longer a collection of the actions that had been done to me i was like a cosmic celestial entity autonomous and individual to my own wants and desires and dreams and it was like whoa that's a lot of responsibility you know and i started having just like you know like my dreams became really i don't know like it just it just opened Everything changed. That's, I guess, the best way that I can say it. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you didn't necessarily come out the same side of the shore. You swam across an ocean and you ended up on the other side and were transformed. I think that's fair to say. And, yeah. and you know, and everybody's still here. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not less for it, but I certainly was greatly challenged by it. There was definitely madness involved. There was definitely inappropriate behavior. There was anger and rage and all of that shit. So I don't know. I don't want to just go off on my diatribe. Like, where, where, where does that? Does any of this strike any chords with you? Out of curiosity. Sure. I mean, you just brought up, you know, the mountaintop. Like when you said the mountaintop, I've just been pondering that a lot lately. Because um, it's really easy to set goals for yourself in life and think you know what you want. And even if you like, you know, well, I guess I should say you know, when you think you see the mountaintop, it's very easy to like set yourself on that course and, you know, swim in that direction, whatever metaphor we're using. Um, but oftentimes when you get to that mountaintop, I think it's really easy something, and I won't speak for you or anyone else, but for me, it's like easy to expect some type of finish line or a fucking trophy or like a high five or, hey, I'm done. I reached the mountaintop. But like that's been the biggest source of dissatisfaction in my life, uh, adult life, is that there's just no, there's no finishing, really. There's no, uh, there's no like credit roll. There's no happy ending. It's just, and then the next day you go to bed and like, it's just kind of like, it's endless. And even if you accomplish a goal, uh, what inevitably happens is you get to the top of that mountain or what you perceive to be the top maybe it's a false summit, but then you look across the valley and it's like, oh, this isn't what I've wanted. This rock sucks and this thing, and it's very hard to like love the mountain you're on because inevitably across the valley, there's a mountain that looks even more majestic, right? And sometimes you decide to try to climb that mountain. Sometimes you try to like um, reflect on where you are and where you've been, but figuring out a way to like really appreciate that specific mountaintop is, seems to be the key and it's very elusive. So I don't know if that's the direction. It's interesting. Would. Yeah, I, I don't know how. Do you, you find satisfaction in like day-to-day -day accomplishments or does it, always do. seem like, does, does it always seem like uh, the next challenge is looming? And it's like, sure, I mean, I'm when I have a minor success, I feel good about it, but then I wake up the next day and it's time to do something else, you know? So. Yeah, I, that's the that's the human condition, in my opinion, is just the eternal struggle to appreciate where you are in the current moment. It's interesting. It's interesting. I just like I can't speak to that model because I just have an entirely different model, and and oh. I don't know. I don't know how the model that I've used to navigate, like let's say, since I've been on this side of the you know the the trauma of my adolescence or whatever you want to say it as fits into that model, because for me. It's all here right now. Hmm. And the struggle is to what degree can I embody the grace that allows it to come closer to me? It's not, it's not in some way that I would try to articulate similar to the way that you're painting the picture. Like, how can I get there? Like, yeah. I have, like yeah. part, of, part of the epiphany that I had, I feel among many others, honest to God, is like, it's all here. 
it's right now. Right. You are there. <laughs> yeah, are. there is there is no there. It's all there's only a here. Um, there is no there. There's the here. I always feel like the goalposts are just moving down the field and receding in the I distance. Yeah, yeah. So but, like, but I think that's I think that's there and there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, right. I, and I think I think that does that. I think it pushes you away from what you truly want. I think that's it. That's an internal struggle. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I know. I'm just speaking my own craziness. But like an internal struggle, 100. percent And uh, it's that's why I do yoga. Is every day trying to overcome that. But even in yoga, um, I encounter myself setting goals and uh, you know, like trying to achieve. And it's it's hard to overcome my upbringing and the paradigm of like competition and the need for success and the need for achievement. And I think that, that that's really deeply distilled or instilled in our culture. And it's like, it sets up a lot of people for misery because as long as you're chasing the the elusive target or you're trying to like hit the goal, you know, like right. get in the end zone, there's no fucking end zone. Like we're all in the end zone right now. And where you're at has to be your end zone this second. And if it's not, then you're gonna be you're gonna suffer. Well, I mean, I don't know, I don't know. I, I I hear you, but but again, I think that there's like there's that weird like dichotomy, right? It's like it's like, but either sides are wrong. Like, okay, let me let me paint it. It's a truth in what we're both saying. You feel me? Like, if you're only goal oriented, then you're that you're that billionaire that has bad relationships in their family. But if you're only you know, Zen on the mountaintop, you're, you're, you know, on, you know, one is on the street corner on top of a soapbox talking about how they're talking to Jesus, you know, like yeah. there needs to be that self-realized person who is consciously moving towards their own paradise. Yeah. And, and, and that's possible. And I suppose I, I feel and believe that that's possible. And that is one of the things that motivates me. You know what I'm always chasing after and it's weird. I didn't think that this was connected, but now like this conversation is doing this interesting circuitous thing where like all these points are coming together. Like, um, I'm constantly, I've, I've talked to my family about this, talked to some friends. I don't know. I think we've discussed this before, but I'm always, I don't want to go into like the Please. mission for it, but, uh, you're familiar with like Plato's allegory of the cave. Sure. Well, yeah, the, 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 the shadows, like the, the elevator pitch. It's basically like there's the, the world that we see and the things we perceive. And then there's the idealized perfect. And I'm probably dumbing this down for sure, but there's the idealized perfect version of those things. And as long as we're constrained to this reality, it's impossible to actually experience that ideal. And so like, I'm always, it's something I wanted to bring up dreams and REM sleep with you later. So I think this is like our connection to that. I often find myself uh, experiencing that sense of the ideal in my dreams. And then like, so I'll see that's interesting. a new city that I want to move to like, Oh, and I'll wake up and I'll be like, Oh, I think that was Seattle or Portland or, or I don't know where that was, but it, it's like less aware and it's more of a feeling. Right. And so you go to the place and maybe you get shades of that feeling, but like, you can never really find that perfection that you experience in the dream. You can never like perfectly distill that feeling that you got from that place in the dream. At least that's how it is for me. And so like, I'm always chasing the perfect version of an event, like the perfect night. I remember when I was in Mexico with my mom, I was trying to explain this to her. Like I, I long for the perfect night out on this town. Like, like, all the perf all the great friends, all the best friends. Um, every event happens in the perfect succession. The weather's fabulous. You stay out. You meet all these glamorous people. There's fireworks. There's like it's packed. You know, like good food, good beverages. Everybody's laughing. You know, like just just that level of perfection. And anytime you go out, I won't speak for you. Anytime that I go out with friends or I go out to dinner or I walk through that town, it's fun and it's great, but it's never that whole idealized version of the event that I conceive of in my mind. And there's very few moments in my life where I've actually felt like the reality matched up with that romantic ideal that I long for. Um, and so that's, 
that's the chase for me, dude. <laughs> it's fighting that. Yeah. Well, that, I think that might be waiting on the other side, to be honest. I think that that may be what death is. It's like, uh, or like our eternal dreamscape or whatever, whatever it comes down to. I but, think, not to interrupt you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was finished. But like, that's, that's, that's something that I always, I've lived most of my adult life chasing my dream, that, that cliche quote or, you know, saying, because I'm trying to go tap into the thing that I actually experienced in, in the dreamscape. I hear you. Sometimes it almost lives up, but oftentimes it's not quite there. I hear you. You know what my honest take is and, and my insight, if I could be so bold, because yeah. I really do believe this. All, and, 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 and I don't speak for you. I'm not a you know, psychologist, but I, if, I, if I had said what you had said and I have experienced what I've experienced, what I would tell myself, and this is, this is my truth hand to God, all of those things are waiting on the other side of you of yourself, of your concept of how, of how things, so there's so many different ways I could connect to it, but like with like pithy, like quotes from this person or that person, but like, okay, so, so Jim Carrey, who like just had an awakening or whatever, you know, and, and has a big beard and was living in the fucking, woods, says, as far as I can tell, it's about telling the universe what you want and then getting the fuck out of the way for how you're going to get it. And, I, and, I, and it sounds like you are really concerned with the mechanism through which you're going to get it, and you're just standing in your own way. Mm. And, and, and this, I would go so far as to justify that because I can speak to my own experiences. I've had that same feeling many, for many years. And I, I, before I had that struggle, I had a different feeling. And after I had that struggle, I had a different feeling. Before, I would just be drinking or smoking weed, and I would not worry. I just wasn't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't resist anything that was happening. I would just participate in it. Yeah. And by my lack of resistance, everything was more conductive. Things moved quicker. The things yeah. that, that were kind of coming came faster and, and magic happens. Then I went through my neurotic phase where I was so concerned with how the fuck do I make myself into a man? How do I be successful? I'm a dirt bag. I'm a piece of shit. I have, had, I have no relative success compared to all these other people you know, I have, I, you know, all of the things that I looked at in my life were not good enough. Yeah. So then I, I just physically tried to grab the pieces and put them in place and it never worked. And then I went crazy. And then I got sane. And now I realize the universe will put the pieces in to the puzzle. I think it's, I think it's hard to understand, as Jim Carrey put it, how to just get out of the way though. Like It's so hard. It's so hard. I, I've struggled with that for years and years and years. I still do. It's so funny. I when you were when you were saying that, it brought up this memory I had recently, where like I was I was doing this assignment uh, for an article, and the article was, um, I was paddling a fucking inflatable unicorn down the Snake River. It was it was a total awesome joke of an assignment, but it was really fun. Um, and a caveat, like as you know, I I have largely quit smoking pot. I smoked pot my whole time, which is great. I don't want to. I don't want to advertise yeah, or something. No, but I don't smoke pot either. For for a, for you know ninety nine percent of the truth, it is. But I noticed that day, um, I was struggling with how to figure out how to paddle this fucking unicorn. There was no control. It was like yeah. it was impossible to navigate and like effectively paddle and control this unicorn. And so I took my first swim in like a class. No you know and we we ended out to a beach i like swam to the beach because i was now like you know um and my boy pulls out a bowl and i was like you know screw it you know uh long story short i got a little intoxicated Ooh, i can't tell this story it's okay um but after, tell, tell after, it in a way that is okay right well long story short after imbibing I knew exactly how to navigate the unicorn. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> and like, like, like my, my neurotic sober brain was getting in its own way. It was trying to make sense of this nonsense thing. And I was, I, I didn't understand. And the second, the second I just like got into alternative headspace, 
it was like, oh, like, oh, I just need to use the current. I need to just pull the current. And I'm not like trying to like, I'm not trying to go forward. I'm just like, like, I'm going to let the current take me. And, you know, I can like put myself in the right place. But it's not about control. It's about surrendering and setting yourself up and doing your best to be in the right place uh, for success. But like, there was no way I was going to like dominate the river on this inflatable unicorn, you know? Bro, so, I think that's a perfect, I think that's a perfect metaphor for life. I that's really like, do. That's how I get back into smoking pot. So I don't want to. <laughs> no, no. I mean, look, I, I quit smoking pot because it was bad for my lungs. And, and I find that uh, dose, you know, finding the correct dose when smoking is really sketchy. And I, I happen to have a, bit, a lot of respect for cannabis as a medicine. And so, you know, when I choose to use it, I use it very dose specific. And I think that there's more responsible ways to do that than like rolling a joint or, or, I mean, for me, for me, cause I, I, I love it so much. I'm the way I tell people is like, I would, when I was smoking pot, I'd have, I'd have a spliff ready to smoke and I, I haven't even lit it yet. And I'm already mentally rolling the next spliff. Like I'm already thinking, where are my papers? Do I have enough tobacco to put a little bead of tobacco? It was super unhealthy. Um, you, you know, spliffs, dude. yeah, no, they're no good. But, but that, that, that's not to denigrate cannabis because I think that there's a really, really potent medicinal yeah. value of cannabis. And I think that you just described it beautifully. It, it deconstructs the bullshit that we tend to operate on all the time, doesn't it? I wish, I wish that it was possible to just have that relationship with it. But unfortunately for me, it incites and causes all types of other negative behaviors that I have tried to control but have very little control over, uh, namely binge eating. Like people talk about the munchies. Like, like I will tell myself. <laughs> I just have to laugh when I visit no, you in Seattle. No, that's serious. Like, like I, I stopped smoking. I started doing hot yoga, and I changed my diet. And having not having cannabis activate that that sugar rush or that sugar need at like 11 p.m. made my whole dietary program. It was like night and day. Like. I will tell myself, I, okay, I got, I got dinner in the fridge. I got, you know, like, I got a Lara bar. You're done. And if I, like, you can smoke, but this is it. This is it. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> 10 30, 11 30 at night rolls around. Yeah. All of that, like, like, I have tried to control it. <laughs> Sudden, yeah. I'm ordering. I'm ordering Domino. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, what you all these shameful things, like um, things that I know are bad for me. And God, I wish that there was a type of strain of marijuana where it was just like no munchies, all benefits, um, just just a good cerebral thing, and it wasn't habit forming. But yeah, just like you said with the spliffs, like. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm like uh, an hour into the high, I'm starting to be like, ooh, I could, I could smoke more. And like, you know, like, there's just no, you want to talk about the end zone receding into the distance. That's an addiction. That's addiction. Like, uh, always chasing that, that like, that perk or whatever it is. Um, it's super self-defeating for me. I hear you. So it can really be functional. And I, God, I wish I could be that way, but. No way. no way. Yeah, I found I found ones that work for me in, in specific circumstances. Like if I have a full day or like at least like all afternoon and evening that where I'm doing like something that's not, you know, uh, let's say it's like free form, like going out to dinner with friends or like we're going on an adventure or we're going surfing or something. I can take one, uh, one to well, one to one, you know, uh, 10 to 10 milligrams of CBD and 10 milligrams of THC of this one particular brand. And it's just like, best ever i don't have any desire to get more inebriated i, I don't want alcohol I, I don't really drink at all and it's just fantastic it's just fantastic it does that thing that i think we're trying to, to to explain at least i feel like is worth explaining and that is like all of the mental constructs that are great if you want to you know use the pythagorean theorem or some bullshit like that but are terrible if you want to just i don't know be a fun guy at a party or 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 yeah. you know, or like not make other people feel insecure because, you know, you're like, like what, the way that I can be but my best self is to stop thinking. And cannabis yeah. tends to make me, it's a weird, it's a weird, I can't, I don't know if I can find words to explain it. Like I think better because I'm not thinking. 
in so many words. You feel uh, me? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, but the same could be said for action sports, like you're surfing. Uh, sure. You're arguably at your best when you're not used to but people are arguably at their best when they're in full state. Right. Um, right. I do that a lot with my writing. Like, you know, I, I mentioned the ideal earlier and like that sense of inspiration. There, are, I think I've said this to you before, but there are a few things that excite me more and make me like understand why I'm alive more than like the moment I have a fun, good idea that I want to put on paper or like, or on a digital screen. Um, the second I come up with a funny headline or a funny concept, uh, I just like, I need to produce it. That's, that gives me so much energy and creative inspiration. Uh, that's like the highest I can really get now. And, that's great. I mean, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing's wrong with it, but you know, you can't, you can't just go down to the, you know, the recreational market and get a recreational good idea. <laughs> you know, like you can't just go get a bag of recreational, uh, you know, funny editorial concepts. It's like, you know, that type of thing you have to, you have to live, you have to learn, you have to like derive the experience from real life. And then you have to be in the right circumstance to stimulate that creative impulse. Uh, a lot of times for me, I'll have ideas in yoga and it's like, it's really meditative practice. Everyone's quiet. There's an instructor and I'll have like a funny headline pop into my head and I it'll like, find, write it I'll finally like, figure out a way to do it or like something I've been teasing out for a week or two. And I'll finally, it'll just like, whoop, and like flipping into my mind and I'll like laugh out loud. <laughs> and everyone, everyone around is just kind of like, what the fuck is this weirdo doing? You know, like so many, so many, those, those moments happen all the time. Cause I have a lot of brain chatter and uh, I giggle to myself a lot in the hot room. And uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> that, <laughs> not, that, that's a good sign. It's the people I practice with. Definitely. I, I think that's a good sign. Yeah, 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 as long as you're in context. Um, you know, there's a little dash of madman in me for sure. I think, uh, I, I mean, there, if you, I'm sorry? As there is with you, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I went full in, dude. I went all in. <laughs> I, I, I felt that and, I, and I, I dove in and I'm better for it. But it got worse before it got better because the flow hit me like a fire hose. I, I, I jumped into the deep end and it took longer for me to integrate the information that I, that I was shown than it did to swim out of it. Like, huh. so it's like, like drinking from a fire hose and it, you, you like, you got drowned by it. But then, but then I rose again, a, you know, a better version of myself. I'm gonna uh, I mean, it, hopefully. Out, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm listening. Um, um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I just think, I think that the, 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 the step of not, like, at, I was going to say not being worried by how we affect the people around us, like you're, like you're describing how, you know, moments of insight make you kind of act out and, and the, the emotional ramification to that is people around you like, ah, you know, I think the first step to like getting in touch with the muse, if you like, is, is saying, I'm just, I'm just not going to worry about how I affect people. Like I'm going to take responsibility for it, but I'm going to, but I'm going to accept that. Like if I want to shine super bright, like people are going to look, you know, people are going to be like, yeah. what the yeah. is going on with that guy? And that's okay. Yeah. Um, and it can be, it can be hard because when you're a creative type, you become so fixated on an idea that it can kind of, take over and like with like my I'm pointing at my other computer but like um with work it's like sometimes so often I should not say this because uh this can be broadcast but like I'll be so impassioned by like an idea that I'll really want to produce it and act on it but you know the thing that pays the bills isn't always your passion project it's so, you know more often right. than not it's not the case and so it's like that hard balance of figuring out a way to like do both and, and to foster that creativity. But a lot of times you'll have an idea, you'll write it, 
And then this speaks to a larger conversation too. Like I was on the phone with a, another freelancer earlier, my friend Lily. We we're talking about how like you'll have this idea or you'll produce an assignment and you'll have a deadline and the, like you'll produce, you'll meet, and this happens so often in life, you'll like meet your commitment. And then the person who, you know, gave you the assignment will just go dark for like a month. And you have that, ex it's like, I, I will readily admit in myself, like I have an expectation of other people, particularly ones I work with, that they're going to adhere to the same standard that I'm trying to hit myself. And it's like, uh, you're just bound to be disappointed when you have that expectation for other people. It's like, you know, like I should not, like if you ask me to produce something by X day and then I do, then that creates all these impulses in my brain, all these expectations that, oh, you're going to deliver on your end and you're going to hit the deadline that you communicated to me. Very rarely do people do that. More often than not, it's like, you hit the target. I can't speak for you, but like, I'll hit the target. Um, and then the party I'm working with will just jerk off for like a fucking month. And I'm kind of left holding the bag. By the time they get to the thing, I'm no longer inspired by it. Or it's like, you know, the, the work and the effort I wanted and the passion I had for it, I've now moved on to something else because, you know, I have shiny object syndrome. <laughs> I just can't, you know, I don't know if that's, is that true for you in your life? Would you say like, uh, it's, I mean, it's true for everyone. It's always dangerous to hold people to the same, to like generate standards by which you hold other people. I don't know. I think, I think that in any relationship, there has to be rules. There has to be expectations. There has to be understandings of the parameters by which the both are going to operate. Like certainly in a partnership, like a, you know, a wife or a girlfriend or, a, you yeah. know, but whatever you're married um, you know i'm married you know so there's obviously conversations around like how we're going to act you know and those are things that are non-negotiable so it's not you know and obviously those things happen in business relationships also it's like if you're gonna do business with somebody you gotta fucking be able to have contracts and things like that's that's the foundation of, of like law and, and and property law and stuff it's like it's all it's all you know one guy's motivation versus the next until it like affects your your house and then it's like no no it's it's in writing you know so i think that there's something to be said for having those kinds of things be absolutely unnegotiable but but um in in terms of like soft relationships or like or like or like verbal relationships or verbal agreements and things like that like yeah, the way that I kind of insulate myself from, from being upset or frustrated is I do not, at this point in my life, allow my emotional well-being or state or, or vibe to rely on anybody else's behavior. I just won't do that. It's just not worth it to me. I don't. I'm sorry. It's hard. It is hard, but, it's, but it's, it feels really good to know that no matter what the other person does, I don't have to take it into my internal space. I just don't. I love what you were saying. I loved what you were saying before we got, uh, before we started recording where you're like, I forget how you articulated it, but it was long lines of like, um, I, I, it applied a lot to my yoga practice. Like you are only responsible for yourself and yes, like, the, like what you're, what you're doing. Like so often, um, my mind will wander. That's right. My mind will wander when I'm yoga and I'm like, I'm like, oh shit, am I in this person's way? Or uh, did my did my laugh make this person think this or that? It's like, yo, like, fuck everyone else. Not like, you know, like you gotta care about other people, but when you're in that room or like when you're in a, a different circumstance, you really just have to only worry about yourself. And the more you worry about other people and you like project, uh, false narratives, the more you can kind of do yourself harm. Yes, sir. There's two ways that I conceptualize it. One is in a sacred space. And I, and I, I would say conversation is a sacred space. And in the same way that like martial arts is a sacred space, you have to respect that the other person is going to defend themselves. Yeah. And not okay. responsibility for them. 
Yes, sir. Because if, if you're going to yeah. spar with somebody and you like knock them out and then everybody says like, how did you, why did you do that? It's like, dude, we were sparring. Like, what do you mean? Why did I do that? Like, he's, he's a warrior. I'm a warrior. Like that's, the, that's the deal, you know? And, 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 and so that's one way of conceptualizing it. I, I think you do a good, a great service to everybody around you. If you respect their autonomy and ability to, how can I say ability is not the right word, their responsibility to voice their own thoughts and feelings. You don't need to feel for other people. I mean, you do for a child, right? You do for somebody who's not capable of, of, of you know, articulating themselves in, their, in the world, but you don't for a, for a, for a, for a, for a person, for a man. Um, and the other way that I conceptualize the idea of radical self-responsibility, yeah, of, of radical, you know, self uh, ownership, if you will, I heard this quote and I thought it was gorgeous and it is, it's, it's kind of a riddle and that is, and, and, and I'll, I have another tangent also, but it's what's the greatest gift you can give to anybody? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Your own happiness. Yeah, sure. At the end of the day, and I, I've thought about that a lot. I think that there's, that's, there's some really, really deep truth to that. And that is like, we always think we know what's best for other people. Yeah. And Alan Watts called it, you know, the monkey picking the fish out of the ocean and saving it from drowning by putting it safely up in the tree. You know, it's like, don't, don't, you know, the fish is going to live the fish life. Like the monkey's going to live the monkey life. Like it's a beautiful thing if the, if the monkey even gets to see the fish for a moment, like that's awesome. Right. But like to, 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 to outsource our ideas of, of another's well being is, 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 tyranny and that's why i that's why i have such a problem with with like the like cancel culture and outrage culture and shit it's yeah. like it's like you're outraged okay that's okay but like a person being upset doesn't give them license to hurt somebody like yeah. or like hurt their life or like you have every everybody has every in my, this is all my opinions so take it with a grain of salt everybody yeah. has every right as far as i'm concerned to say whatever the fuck they want to say. That's what freedom of speech is about. You can, you can say how angry you are, upset you are, how much of a POS that person is or this person is. Good, good for you. That's great. Maybe that, maybe that creates some change. But what I don't feel is okay is taking a person, putting them into a room, putting them into a corner, and making them fucking do what you think. That's, not, that's just not okay. And, and, and the way that I got to that understanding is through this idea of when I'm in the yoga room and I'm not, I'm no better at this than anybody else. Believe me, I'm just as neurotic, just as self, you know, defend, self, self, um, you know, involved. And, and, and I'm, oh, what is that person thinking? What is this person thinking? It's just when I, when I do get to that low state, I realize that that's yeah. all nonsense. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I just say that, but I, when I do get to that flow state, I realize that that's all nonsense. And, and, and furthermore, it's destructive and it's hurtful, not only to myself, but everybody that I interact with when I'm, when I'm yeah. possessed by those kinds of like weird eccentricities that are, that are based on what I think the other person thinks. And that's just, what the fuck does that mean? How about, why well, don't I just express how I think or what I think? Uh, uh, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll end the thought with this. The guy who has fucking really taken this and run with it, the, the, this exact concept is Jocko Willick. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah, yeah, I've seen him interviewed on Rogan. I really enjoy him. And he wrote a book called Extreme Ownership. I haven't read it, but I really want to read it. Um, I, I intend to read it. And it's just that idea of shit gets better when we take extreme ownership over everything in our lives. All the yeah. good, all the bad, every relationship, every interaction, every situation. Like, because then you can't lose. If you fuck up, you fucked up. And if something good happened, you made it happen. And so what does that mean? The bad things, you can make them better. And the good things, you can do them again. But if, if you take any other narrative about your own experience, then you just give away your power. Oh, yeah. those, those people did this to me, or this happened to me because of, you know, nebulous concepts like the economy. And it's like, that just doesn't, that doesn't get us up at four in the morning and work out oh. like that motherfucker does, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, there are certain, like, you mentioned the economy, like, you know, if the economy goes off a cliff, it does negatively affect I you. I feel you. No, right, right. So you there, know, like, I, under, I understand. On that, you can try to hustle and get another job and there's no fucking jobs. And, you know, I, I do think that there are certain like macro forces that do, you know, definitely play a role in our lives. How right. Tra I mean, tragedy happens. Like there's no, there's no denying that, right? It reminds me of like when I was living in 
China, this was a fundamental difference in cultures that I encountered was, um, and I loved Chinese people completely. Uh, you know, I, I found that like Chinese people and American people, we shared like the same type of style of sense of humor. Like I would find myself on the street, like I'd see something and I'd laugh at like having observed it and I'd turn and the same guy would be like, you know, the guy next to me would like be chuckling at the same thing. We'd be like, ha, ha, motherfucker. You know, like, <laughs> like there were a lot of those moments. Um, but in terms of extreme ownership, it was very much like, it seemed like on a day-to-day -day level, it was hard to find accountability. Like nobody seemed eager to take direct responsibility or ownership like for something that had gone wrong, right? Like here- Yeah, different culture, huh? I mean, socialist mentality, huh? Communist I don't, rather. I don't, I don't, I don't want to fall out. I don't want to guess that. I, 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 you know, it was just something I, I observed where like, to better or worse, I think it's actually kind of, it can be actually harmful in American society, but we are definitely encouraged to take ownership over our fuck ups. And it's like, no, that wasn't their fault. You fucked up. And like, there's almost like in work culture and like, like corporate culture, just like in adult life, it's almost like you're better off taking ownership because if right. you pass the buck, no one will respect you for it. Well, it uh, just doesn't, it doesn't help. Doesn't really, get better. Uh, just if you're always like trying to, like, yeah, like pass the blame off on other people. And like, I think there's a lot of self efficacy and self empowerment and saying, you know, I made a mistake and I didn't do this correctly. Yeah. People uh, respect that. I didn't, I know you asked me to vacuum and I didn't vacuum. And that's bad. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Like, yeah. look, that's a really weak example. No, I get it. But so, isn't that better than like, I couldn't find the plug. Okay. I don't yeah, know where the plugs yeah, are. We're, and it's we're, like, look, it was seriously, giant, like you wouldn't get the, you wouldn't get the, like, you asked me to do this. I didn't do it. I'm sorry. Cause it's all about, it's all about face over there and like the concept of like saving face. So like, it's actually, it was rude of you. It would be rude of me to try to like put someone in a corner and be like, you didn't vacuum. You always see. leave somebody, you always leave somebody a social out over there. Huh. So, it, so it doesn't have to like land on them. Uh, and that's at least how I found it. So like, it would be, it would be like, yo, it looks like you didn't vacuum. It's like, oh, well, I couldn't find the vacuum or I couldn't find the thing or the thing wasn't working or like, there's always kind of like, it's never like, yeah, you're right. I didn't vacuum. Um, and that's a whole, that's a whole lot different, that ownership than offering excuses of why. Same thing. Oh, you know, I thought we were going to meet at the gym at 4 a.m. To, to like train. Like, oh, well, you know, uh, my alarm clock didn't go off or I, uh, I, you know, I had a late night last night. These are all excuses. Um, the person who wants to be at 4 a.m. at the gym will show up to the gym at 4 a.m. You know, 90%. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I would imagine that's what Jocko is talking about is like, showing up, being your best self, executing on your commitments and just, you know, not letting people down and taking ownership over, you know, your mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. We're all going to fuck up. Like I fucked up so many times in life, but it was an immense source of empowerment when I like started owning my mistakes versus like blaming other people. And we, we discussed that a little bit ago for sure. Yeah. I'm, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it, really. it, it hasn't made life any easier. It's just made me feel better about myself as I go through the struggle of life. It makes me, it makes me feel like I am capable of meeting the next challenge because, you know, come what challenges, um, you know, may present, I believe in my ability to, like, I'm, I'm not giving myself an existential out as silly as that sounds as stupid as that sounds saying I'm not I'm not I'm not saying if everything works right things are going to be okay for me I'm saying it's on me yeah 
that doesn't guarantee success. It's just, it's a lot more encouraging than, oh, I hope, you know, the housing market does this, or I hope that person feels this way about me, or I hope, you know, I affect this person the right way. It's like, yeah, I don't really have any control over those things, but what I do have control over is me. And yeah. that's, you know, that's fucking hard enough. Like that's, that's the struggle. And I think showing up for that at 4 a.m. every day is yeah. a lot of work. And I think it's way easier to, to eat, the, eat the extra meal at 1030 and, and smoke that second spliff or third spliff and, and blame it on, you know, the, the alarm clock. And, you know, I don't know where I put the vacuum. And that's just an easier way to live. But, but, but I, I genuinely feel this. That leads to hell. It doesn't lead to heaven. You know, I'm in this situation right now where, like, I, I made more fitness. I hit my fitness goals more steadily last summer than I did this summer. And I got down to a lower weight and I was in better shape. And a big part of that um, is because I had a gym in my apartment building that I was living in last year. So I would like, that's go, awesome. I'll, I'll go get on the elliptical whenever the fuck I could. Like, that's what I do. I do the elliptical. I love that, dude. I love the elliptical. And, yeah. you know, but I mean, without diving into that, it's like I had it at my fingertips. I go get on the elevator, go down and just like, bam, like you're on right. the elliptical. Knock it out. Get a great 400, 500 calorie workout then you go throw in the yoga all of a sudden you're at like a, a good caloric deficit right where now i got this full-time job and yeah i still go to like you know bikram every day but it's like you know the intermittent fasting kind of gets fucked because like i'm waking up earlier and you know it's like and and there's no elliptical and and now i'm 10, five ten pounds over where i want to be and like it's yeah i could get up earlier i could get a gym membership i could try harder um, and that's, that's the, the bind that a lot of people find themselves in where they're like, well, God, like, is it worth it? Is it worth it to be 10 pounds lighter, but wait, but to pay more and to have the membership and no longer have to go get in my car and drive to the gym and put in that, you know what I mean? Like, yes. yes. What is it worth to you to, to hit this fucking target? And I'm not doing it right now. And part of me yeah. is really disappointed. Uh, well, you know, I, the way I see it, I, I don't no. know. No, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I think I, I think I have some, some kind of scaffolding to inject into that mental map that may help you navigate it. I really do. I think your, your presupposition is that life is, 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 is a stable point, but it's just, yeah. absolutely, it's just absolutely not. It never well, will be. Oh, look, I was, I, I was, 220 pounds and now I'm 180. So Bro, like, I'm proud of you. But all I'm saying is, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm just saying like, if that, if last summer's experience of like weight transformation taught me anything, it's that I could, I could gain 50 pounds back. And if I got passionate enough, I could lose 60. You know what I mean? Like you can, you can rise and fall. You can ebb and flow. You can, you know, like, however, that level of dedication and passion that I had last summer, I know in my heart is not being matched now. Here's and, a thought. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, go go on. It just sounds like that, that, that's it. That's but you're absolutely right. Like we're not at fixed points in our lives. We we can gain and lose. We can you know fortunes rise and fall. Uh, you know all of those things. And it's important to remember that. But it's it can be discouraging when you lose. Uh, you know a quotient of that passion that you once have that pushed you, that allowed yourself to push to great things. Okay, let me ask you a question. When you were meeting your goals or exceeding your goals, other than weight, hmm. what else in your life improved? I was less angry. Boom. <laughs> less angry. Um, I mean, this had a lot to do with the yoga, but I was less like, I was less likely to, you know, yoga and meditation, it's all about like having the thoughts, but letting them pass and recognizing that you like certain things triggered your thought patterns, but not latching onto those emotions. Um, I'm more likely now to like latch on to anger when it comes up in my mind than I used to be. Um, I felt better, man. 
So this is this, this is my this is my theory. I was miserable too because I was like my diet was just like brutal and like you know. I get it. This is my theory. This is my theory, and this is why I think I, I want to say it not to not to be like listen to me talk because I think it's it's oh, no, it's, no, we're, we're having a conversation. it's fine. It's valid to when a person moves in a direction towards one specific goal and then loses motivation for that. And I would argue there's, it's never, it's never unilateral. Moving towards something that's a good aim brings about a better world for you. Yeah. Not yeah. just, not just that thing. Yeah. So like if I focus on, I mean, you know, we don't have to just talk about your, you and yoga and, 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 you know, your weight, I can, I can, I can do it's it a for, for myself. Just, right. It's, it's a, it's a model for behavior, I would argue. And that is, and, and Jordan Peterson talks about this and, and full disclosure, I'm a Jordan Peterson fan. He's in, he's in rehab right now for Klonopin. So, you know, best of, of luck and good, you know, thoughts to him. Um, yeah. But uh he, the way that he, he has this, this thing that people can buy and I would, I would buy it, but I, you know, I've kind of, gotten the concept that I've kind of done the work for myself and I, I, you know, it helps me a lot. And it's like through like several questions, conceptualize like all the different kinds of decisions that you make. And like, if you made all of them perfectly, like what would your life look like in five or 10 years? Like, like conceptualize the heaven that you could manifest for yourself. If you did everything right, if you ate ex exactly just perfect, if you, did all, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't have to spoon feed it to you. If you just made every right decision, you know, beside yourself, what would life look like? Mm -hmm. But that's not it. Now, because we all know our own demons, you know, given our own eccentricities, or our own idiosyncrasies, or our own, you know, issues with our own minds. And I've got them just like everybody else has got them. And, and it's not for other people to know, but it's for certainly for, the, for, for ourselves to confront. Imagine if you just, just went the other way. Imagine if you just did, did, did the wrong decision at, on all vectors. <laughs> what, what, what would life look like? What would, what would your relationships look like? What would your home look like? What would your body look like? It's like, look at it in detail and look at those two. And that what gets you up at four in the morning. That's what keeps you on your diet. That's what has you tell the truth to people. That's what have, helps, you know, us to check our egos. That's what helps us to be like, whoa, like maybe I'm just reacting as opposed to like moving towards that future that I really want. And it's like knowing that those two are equally real, like knowing that we can slide into either one at any time based on one decision is really helpful because it's like, I know my own shit better than anybody else does. And I'm sure you know your own shit better than anybody else does. And it's easy. It's real easy. And it's really kind of like a trick of the, of the, you know, mind, the frontal cortex on ourselves to I'm allow saying, ourselves to, I'm so, no, 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 no. I'm saying to make the bad decisions. Just, oh, yeah. just, just step by step. Ah, uh, I don't have to get up at 4am. I'll just get up at 6am. That guy, that guy knows that 4am is too early. He'll forgive me. I, I'll just eat tonight. Just, I'll just eat a little bit too much. You feel me? Like I could go on and on and on with my own shit. I'll just roll one swift. It'll be no problem. But that, that's not. Same cliff on me. But you, you see what I mean? Like keeping aware of the fact that we are responsible for moving in a direction of either good or bad at any time. Like, like that the existential heaven and hell are real and that people are living in one or the other. Absolutely no question. Uh, here, now, not, you don't have to wait for the afterlife for those experiences is fire under our ass to work towards the, I mean, I really believe that. And, and I think that people that have been in mental illness, people that have been to war, people that have been addicted to drugs, people that have, you know, seen, you know, loss and tragedy and struggled with deep, dark places of emotion and so forth. I think that that's a real potent fuel. If, if dealt with appropriately, if, if, you know, like, you know, you can't like, it's, there's lessons there. Right. Huh. And, I think that they can help us. I do. That's tough, you know, it's a slippery slope. And um, I just think about the pot thing. You, you mentioned the, the one spliff and it's like. Yeah, it just opens the door, doesn't it? Even, you know, well, it opens the door and it's never like, it's like, it's like a, it's like a large pizza. 
it always sounds like a good idea. Like, like a huge fucking joint with like, you know, like A grade cannabis and like a bunch of, a bunch of keef. Yeah, keef and hash oil. And like and hash, yeah. 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 Well, the, the best, yeah. you know, like, like yeah. a grade. It yeah. sounds, it sounds great, right? But then it's the, the dirty trick of life is, for me at least, it always kind of, the ex actual experience is always kind of a letdown. And what the, the, the arguably like the best part of the whole thing is the anticipation. It's not even like, like sex is kind of the same way. I mean, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but, uh, <laughs> but like, I'm just saying that most experiences that you put up on a pedestal, it's pretty hard to like have them meet reality. Like most highs that I get from smoking cannabis, I always, I, like when I was younger, I'd be like, oh, I wanna go, go in, in the redwoods and go get, you know, go smoke weed and like go on a hike. But then like, it sounds like mystical and enchanting as an idea, as a concept, right? Uh, as an ideal but then the reality is that you just like go get stoned in the woods and you're just kind of like stoned in the woods and that's like that is the experience there's no enchantment there's no mysticism to it you're just a stoned bro in the woods and that's, that's I don't know man you're like you're like I kind of like smoking yeah meat. yeah I, 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 I disagree with you only, only because I just said it sounds like you're 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 disenchanted with life and it sounds like that that is something that frustrates you and it sounds like you're accepting of that and i don't think that you have to be huh. life is extraordinarily enchanting think about this just as a point of argument just as a logical chain no i think i think hold on hold on before you launch in what i'm trying to say is give me a sec it's if I think that smoke going and smoking pot in the woods is going to trump the actual just sober experience of going and walking in the woods, I'm always going to be wrong. And it's always going to be a letdown. There's no like, there's no value add uh, to, to doing, to getting intoxicated and doing it. But I guess we could go in the loop and talk about the whole river and like, you know, the yeah, I mean, I like smoking pot. So, I mean, I, I just, I, I, you know, I agree to disagree, but like, like all I'm saying is I think that the real, the real point you're making is, and it's a valid one is anytime we have an expectation, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a silhouette or a stencil. This is the, my, the way that my brain conceptualizes. Yeah. I'm listening. And then we have an experience. As long as you give a fuck about your expectation and you don't have to is the point. But as long as you give a fuck about your expectation, then you're constantly going to be looking at where they don't match up. You've yeah. got two pictures that you're focusing on. Yeah. And all you're going to see when you lay one picture on top of the other is where the lines don't match, is where the blurs between them, is where there's, there's gaps and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, bro, the answer is real simple. Get rid of your fucking expectation. Yeah. And, and, and the justification that I need to, 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 to make that point is simple. All beautiful works of art, every... I mean, for God's sakes, every book that's ever been written, every painting that's ever been painted has been painted from people's experience. Mm -hmm. It wasn't from their expectation. It was from their inspiration of their actual experience of life. So of course life is magical. Of course life is mystical. Because all of the th signs that, we point, that have pointed us in our language, in, our, in everything, in pop culture, has come from people that have shared that with us, uh, you know, that have come before us. We edited, co-edited the other night. That's perfect, right. You know, perfect example. I, I, I do think that there is enchantment and mysticism and beauty and magic in the world. I absolutely think that there is. And I think that the, 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 the simple fact that, that there is even a flimsy ar argument against that is, 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 is sad, is, 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 is a propensity for, for tragedy, for despair, for depression, for anxiety in young people. And it's something that, that, that needs to be articulated against. And that's why I have been really fundamentally drawn to Jordan Peterson because one of his foundational arguments is the hero's journey yeah. is real. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not separate from us. It's, it's, it's why we like Star Wars. It's why we like Lord of the Rings. It's why yeah. we, why the Bible has lasted because that idea is 
a absolutely beautiful and very relevant and very valid symbolic representation of the human experience. You are the hero for a hundred percent. And it's to what degree you want to go through the dark forest and, you know, find the sword of Excalibur or what have you in the, in the, in the lake and come back and, you know, do the thing. It's like, it's on you. And it's like, it's, 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 it's a fallacy to say it should happen this way or that way or the other way. And, you know, life's losing its luster because it's not having this way or that. It's like, leave that shit up to the, to the world. You know, that'll, that shit will get worked out. It's like, to what degree can you be courageous in the face of adversity? That's the question. To, to jump in here, I think, like, I know what you're saying. And I, I agree that the, like the hero's journey is inside all of us. Uh, but just to reference back to the point I meant about like marijuana and going for the hike in the woods, like that's less, uh, what, I'm not trying to say that life isn't enchanting and life doesn't have any magic to it. It certainly does. And it offers us many opportunities for personal transformation and personal yeah, growth. Well said. But like, as long as I'm trying to like, for me, marijuana is like I'm trying to offset that responsibility to a third party or an external force where like the, the, the greatest empowerment and the greatest transformation can come from inside, not when I smoke a bunch of cannabis. Like the ultimate expectation, I hear you. The ultimate expectation is expecting that the, process, the, the, the experience will be better because I go get high and have it. Right. Like, you know, I hear you. That's just having a crutch. And it can be fun, but it always kind of falls short uh, of what I hope it will feel like. Right. Right. I, I get it. I get I it. But it's on the beach in Mexico, it's like, well, then you'll just be stoned in Mexico. Like, <laughs> it's not. It's not so magic. Uh, anyway, I can go on, but yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I just I, like I think the, the 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 message I'm hearing that is one that I would like to try to offer uh, an opposing viewpoint to is. Hmm. Like it's never as good as the expectation. And I just think that it can be way, 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 way better. And it, and it should be if we can like yeah. use, use our imagination in a constructive way as opposed yeah. to a destructive way. Or not even use your imagination. It's always the knights, funny you say that. Like it's always the knights. Whenever I have a night that I'm gonna go out and like have a great night with my friends, it ends up just kind of being a dud. But the best nights are always the ones where I'm like on the fence about going out at all. And yeah. I understand I that. Feel like doing this. I don't really feel like going to this party or like. Then you go to the party, and, and it's popping, and it's great. And right. like, yeah, you know, it's like a world of new experiences that you didn't expect, and those those are always fantastic experiences for 99 percent of the time i hear you you know where my brain goes not to interrupt you i'm sorry no no no, no. i was done that's why i have such an issue with advertisements because i feel like it's indoctrinating us to have visual and mm -hmm. and material expectations of our lives which are exactly the things that i think we've we've explained fuck our lives up the uh, best thing is Maybe I'll have a car in a few years. And then in six months, when I like lease a new super, I'm like, this is great. But if I spent a year being like, I, maybe I want this car, maybe I want that car, maybe I like those rims better. Oh, I really wonder about what kind of audio system I'm gonna have. Well, that guy has that audio system. Then inevitably when I get my car, it's gonna suck, yeah. you know? And, and to, the, to your same point, it's like, I could go out tonight. You know, I got a little bit of work to do. Maybe I'll just stay out. Ah, fuck it, I won't go out. And then your boy calls you up and he's like, hey man, you gotta come out, like this is super cool. And you're like, I don't know, man, let me, let me text you a little bit, I got shit to do. And you could put it down and you're like, well, I don't know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. But I like him, you know, I, I trust my boy, you know, he's telling me it'll be fun, so fuck it, I'll leave it up to the universe, you know? I just think that's a, that's a fair way to say it. Mm -hmm. And then you go and you take that leap of faith into the unknown. You're not going with expectations. It's not the first model that we talked about where, I'm going with my friends and I've picked them and we're going to go here and then we're going to go to this other place and it's going to be this and everybody's going to feel this way and then they're all going to clap when I say this. That never works. Or if it does, you're just an asshole because you've told everybody what to do. What yeah. works is we're like, well, that place looks kind of funky. Like that looks like a fucking dive bar. I see like a dartboard. Like anybody play darts? Like 
And then you go and you have a fucking beautiful time and you meet some person who knows somebody who played golf. You know, it, it, connect yeah. like connections will happen, right? Yeah. And it's like, to what degree can we, I don't know. Open just be, open ourselves up. Open ourselves up is a, is a, is a good way of saying. Yeah. And the reason why I defend cannabis against just looking at it like, it's just something that just makes you stoned and then nothing's better. It's like, I find sometimes, and, it's, and I, and I want to be really clear if anybody's listened to this, if I know my dose, if I know what strain it is, if I've you know, done my due diligence on the company that I'm getting the product from, whether it's a little edible or you know, whatever, it does make me open up. And it makes me open up in a really beautiful way where I'm like, I'm like more... I'm like more heart centered and I'm like more perceptive of how people feel. I'm not like neurotic about it. I'm not, I don't, I don't, I'm like, I'm not worried about it, but I'm like genuinely caring about how I affect people. And it makes me softer and it makes me gentler and it makes me like, it makes me allow things to flow better. And I'm still like popping, like the ideas are still coming, but I tend to have really wonderful times. And, and that's not to say that I am, you know, wanting to have cannabis every day. I'm not, cause I can overdo it real fucking easy. But I do think that cannabis, just in and of itself, and, and this is no secret, like it's everywhere and everybody knows how good it is, but it can be, it can be really potent, especially for injecting that enchantment and magic and mystery if, if I don't know, if done in the way that works for you, right? Yeah, but, okay, so I think, it's, I think it's unique to every single person's physiology. Right. And to like, for, for as it applied to me in that that unicorn river context right it's not something that i can do and have be productive on the couch it's not something i can do and have be productive if i'm going out with my friends because i'll just be dumb and introverted um but if i just it's not something i can do and have be effective if i need to sit down and write like most people talk about oh it makes me more creative yeah it makes me more creative but not in like a cognitive way it makes it almost makes me more creatively intuitive so like right the river example like you just feel it yeah yeah my the way i felt the universe all of a sudden clicked in and i understood maybe it's because i've rafted and boated so much high <laughs> i don't know but like uh it 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 took away my logical brain and put me on a more intuitive uh, it gave me a more intuitive sense of where I was at and uh, like the flow of what I was trying to do. And it made it a lot easier and more understandable. And it made the experience way better. Like that was fucking sick. Like after, after I, I puffed and got back on the unicorn, like, like glitter, the unicorn, like, yeah. like hammered down, you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. the sure. rest of that run was amazing. Like, like glitter was glitter. glitter that 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 was the that was the unicorn's name. Yeah. Well, originally the unicorn's name was Horny, but <laughs> for editorial for editorial yeah. purposes, I, yeah. <laughs> I changed it to glitter. But like Horny slash glitter pre uh, pre Bolsesh was like this inflatable kitsch toy that like was gonna get crushed on the river. But after that sesh, I like understood the glitter, like, 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 it sounds so cliche and corny. No, no, I'm following you. I write about it in the piece, but like literally glitter was then infused with this sense of, so yeah, like enchantment and magic. It's, it's funny that I was just telling you that like, it never makes things enchanting or magical because that's exactly what happened on the river that day. Like glitter was transformed from this inanimate piece of shit plastic that held air incidentally into like this, this like soul, uh, like soulfully poetic creature of the river that like was from the, the mystical rainbow realm beyond. And like, That's beautiful, dude. Was able, to, was able to like, like teach me something about the river and like get me to like understand myself and the flow of the universe in a whole new way. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I heard some. I'm sorry. It sounds so silly, but like, no, it like, really doesn't. And so, like, is marijuana a bad thing? Not all the time, because sometimes 
that can that can be spurred into reality. Like you can have that type of experience. But 90% of the time, I'm not out discovering some new sense of wonder on a, a beautiful you know river in the Teton wilderness. I'm on a couch or in the city, like getting stoned and eating pizza and like like so it should be used very specifically for very specific purposes, not the way that by and large our culture uses it. Um, that's just my two cents or my like. Yeah, two. I mean, I think that there's a slippery slope there just because you're you're so onto it. In, in my opinion, when you talk about your experience, the pitfalls that you've noticed, the things that work that you've noticed, but but I think that you should be really careful where that slides into what other people should do. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, it's physiologically individual, individual and unique to each person. And just being your friend for so long and knowing, you know, and seeing the effect it has on you, the way that you imbibe, um, as opposed to me, or like the way that some of my like close friends uh, can use it. I know some people who like are super functional. They can like take bong rips and go to work and be cognitively, you know, in like high capacity corporate roles and they're like fine. And, you know, it's so funny, like, when I've, when I've taken a bong rip, you know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, there's no, there's no way I'd like go walk into a corporate office after like, just like, just, just pop, like, <laughs> like, like milk in a chamber up and shit. Like, you know, there's no way. Like, Dude. you just read it on my face. <laughs> I'm, at, I'm at the beach. I'm with this dude, Matt uh, Chummers, who I've, I worked at a, at a sales role with. And he had a, a friend that was working with him at the time. I had not worked at the agency for a while. And his friend, God bless him. I, first of all, I had like a little, like half of a joint left, like very, you know, a couple puffs. And I wanted to be, you know, inclusive. So I was offering everybody a puff. And we were about to swim or surf. So it was like, you know, I knew I was going to process and, you know, we were going to have food after. So it, it was going to be hours and hours and hours before I had to like, deal with life you know so it was whatever it was appropriate it was the right time you know right place right time and i have to laugh because this motherfucker pulls out a dab rig we're on the beach like in beach chairs like wetsuits like halfway up like, and shit. bro he pulls out a blowtorch <laughs> and he's like gonna offer me a dab and i'm like bro just put it put it away like put it away like i don't i'm not in, like i don't want that shit i'm sorry like that's way 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 overkill for what i'm about like i'm not trying to dab right now like what are you talking about narcotic at that point it's what yeah what or feeling like once you're like once you have a blowtorch yeah no I was, i'm not about that blowtorch life dude it's like um that's what i always enjoyed about <laughs> cannabis that it was like this kind of friendly halfway drug but then once you're blowtorching your dab rig yeah like no, it's full and, on. And it's you might as well, you might as well just be injecting pots into your veins, you know. You might like, as well just be yeah. You might as well just be <laughs> syringing yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was I. It was like a. It was like a culture shock. I like didn't know how to have the conversation because I didn't want to offend him. He was offering it to me, you know. And then it quickly became this like, don't be a punk, dude. Like what you know what you can't handle. And I'm just like like I, I don't I don't bite on those things anymore. I'm too old for that shit, but I was just like, dude, like, it's your world, man. Dab it up. Like, there's kids on the beach. Homeboy's got a blowtorch and a bunch of glass pipes and shit. It's like, you know, it's one thing to have a little thing, you know, like, whatever. Glass pipe. Like yeah, what? Well, yeah, right. And, and Homeboy's got a big, he's got it in a cooler. Like, he had to bring the whole paraphernalia and sit it down and, like, pull out multiple, like, sub packs. And I'm just like, bro, like, what you know so yeah i think i think that the the magic of it and the and like the way that dude Rog like i'm, I'm fanboying out on rogan so forgive me but his um insight on weed because because he, he 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 uses less words for things and i do value that because i tend to use way too many words but he goes weed's a tool it's like a hammer you can build a fucking house with a hammer or you can hit yourself in the head with a hammer it's yeah. up to you it's a tool and i'm like that's right and anybody that's smoked weed before knows yeah. that's right. And, and, and this is a weird tangent, but like 
the thing that I think is so fucked up about like federal regulation is the people that have a problem with weed have never smoked weed. Like, let's be honest. Like, you know, Jeff Sessions has never had, sat down and had a session, you know? Yeah. And, and it's a beautiful experience, isn't it? To be with friends, be in a circle. You don't have shit to place to be. You don't have shit to do. And it's just like, let's just flow, dude. And that shit gets passed around. And all of a sudden, everybody's on the level. And somebody says some interesting shit or somebody says some really sweet, heartwarming thing that, that they might not have said otherwise. And you're like, whoa, like, I feel the same way, man. Like, I love you too. Like, I didn't know that, you know, like, word up. Like, you know, I'm glad that you did that. Or I'm glad that you were there for me for this. Or, you know, and, and, and cannabis, for whatever reason, facilitates that. And yeah. to, to have that be lost in the weeds, you know, no pun intended, by just doofuses who don't know what the fuck the deal is, is a real tragedy. But I heard, um, well, Graham Han I'm sorry. That sounds kind of, that sounds kind of Devin centric to be like, like, you know, your think reality, about not someone else's real. Homie, think about somebody who's in prison. You know, I'm talking about the guy on the beach with the dab rig. Like maybe that's appropriate to him. Um, oh, oh, right. No, yeah, right. No, what I'm saying, what I'm talking about is the legislation. The fact that it's federally illegal and that people are in prison for it and that it does have this real beautiful side to it when used appropriately. And, and maybe that dab rig for that homie is appropriate. Maybe he has such a high tolerance that that's how he gets on the level and treats his, you know, people in proximity to him right. I'm not judging that. I'm judging that there's this overarching national opinion of pot that just couldn't be more wrong. You know? It's definitely changing. It is. It is. Uh, uh, Graham Hancock was saying on, on Rogan and I, and, and uh, I, I apologize for just being a parrot, but like, he goes, you know, one of the things that I'm really encouraged by in this country, because he's a Brit, is, uh, you know, the cannabis legislation has, has said, no, we're going to, we're going to leave it up to the people. And it started with the fucking states and it's now, you know, it's, and that's beautiful, right? Like the federal government has one opinion, but the people know the truth and we're just doing it anyway. Fuck them. Yeah. And you can't stop cannabis anymore. It's and the genie is out of the bottle, you know, and for good and for good reason. You yeah. know, a lot of people are benefiting from it, and we obviously are struggling with it or whatever from from the way that we've described and have kind of found ways that work and ways that don't, and that's that's good, you know. Um, it's like the whole the whole dab thing or not dab thing, the whole um, vape thing's been really interesting to follow because I encountered something similar, um, and this is to speak to like some of the negative consequences of legalization is like we just haven't done enough science to really like some people are gonna encounter some negative effects and side effects along the way like when i was um when i was living in seattle working contract last winter i started vaping for the first time consistently in my life thc capsules uh oil and while i never got like pneumonia i never got one of these like really bad lung infections you're you're hearing about now um, there was a period for about like two to three months where like I couldn't take full deep breaths. Like it was like something was constricting part of my lung capacity. And I had like maybe preliminary symptoms for what I've been hearing about is so, so it's just, it's interesting to hear that people are actually in the hospital now with more severe versions of what I directly experienced from uh, imbibing in that manner on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, so have you seen supposedly, and the CDC hasn't come back yet, but it's, for, it's, it's due to vitamin E acetate. Oh. Have you read that? Yeah, you gotta look it up. The, the, I, Cause I posted a thing that I had read on my Facebook and Kenny Pham came up and goes, what's mysterious about it? Cause it was like the, 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 the title was, mysterious or mysterious deaths linked to you know vaporizer use and he goes what's mysterious about it and, I'm, and i was like kind of indignant but i'm not going to talk shit i'm like well you know in the article it says that like he, these these terrible pulmonary disorders are coming people are dying and they're not exactly sure what's the the cause because to be to be clear you know is it an, is it an ingredient in in certain um you know cartridges is it is it is it just the the, the solvent is it the solute you know what i mean is it is it what's you feel me? So, and, and, and he was like, no, dude, like, I know what it is. And I'm like, well, what is it? And he sent me links. And apparently the, the best science coming out right now is that the thing that's been causing these people to die, and I, I'm not um, endorsing vape pens. I had the same 
the same feeling. I was vaping for a little while and I do a lot of cardio because I, because my brain goes and doesn't stop. And the way that I calm myself down is I'll go on a bike ride or I'll go on the elliptical or I'll go for a swim. And then I'm like, chill. I get all that energy out. Uh, and when I was vaping, I noticed that uh, like on my exhalation, I would wheeze. I was like, <laughs> And I like couldn't get as much of a, of a breath in. And sometimes I would spit up a lot. Like I would have a productive cough for my lungs. So the same kind of shit. Um, but interestingly, supposedly the, 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 the thing that's going on is cartridges are, are making their way onto the black market and they're being refilled. And, and one of the things that's being used for the, for the solvent. So they take like a little bit of, of oil, hash oil or, or whatever the fuck, and they put it in vitamin E acetate, which is apparently easy to get or, or what have you. I'm no expert, but this is what I've read. And that is, is killing people. And he, he showed me a thing and it was kind of just like a hack news show saying it. And then I read another article about it that, that said the same. So it may be that the vape industry is getting hit unduly and that like the reputable sources of these cartridges and shit are like, are like healthy and that the ones that are sketch balls are the ones that are killing people. But I, I have had the same experience. I'm not about vaping. I don't, doesn't, doesn't give me a, a great high the way that like a, a edible capsule does. And I just don't like fucking with my lungs anymore. I heard yeah. something that, that makes me feel that way. And that is, you know, that the lungs are the most, uh, the biggest producer of DMT in your body. Hmm. Like, like holotropic breathing and like pranayama and all that, like there's a reason for it, like bringing about like heightened states is because you, you, you can manipulate your lungs ability to release DMT through conscious breathing. Yeah. So that's fucking interesting. <laughs> we were going to talk about REM sleep, dude. What happened? I, I, I mean, we kind of, we dipped into the sleep stuff. I'm, uh, I mean, we've been going for a while, but. We go for like an hour and a half on this this record. Um, I oh man, I don't want to bite off REM sleep right now because that'll be another half hour of us talking. Well, just give me give me a, a one you know your thesis, and I won't I won't you know fuck with it. I'm just interested to hear what you think. I don't necessarily have a thesis. Um, all I know, man, REM sleep is you know REM sleep to me is this insane creative driver where I can like compose songs and produce works of art just on a whim. And it's like, they're not even, I always wonder if like, like in the dream, I'm telling myself that the songs are like good songs and they're like, like full stories. And I, I wonder if it's a component of the dream itself that you think it's good um, versus it That's actually objectively being good. Like, like, I wonder if by it happening in a dream, you're naturally inclined to think that it's actually, it makes sense. The same way that uh, you flying on an elephant in a dream makes sense. You know what I mean? When you're dreaming it, you're just flying on an elephant. And it's not, very rarely are you like, unless you're a lucid dreamer, are you like, wow, I'm uh, flying on an elephant and this is fucking weird, so I must be dreaming. Like, more often than not, most people, myself included, are just going to, encounter the process of flying on the elephant and say, and not even realize it's absurd, right? But that said, tangentially, the other thing that I encounter a lot in my dreams, which always occur in REM sleep, is I mentioned earlier how I, um, I go play, I've been to places in my dreams, I like encounter different geographic areas in my dreams. Maybe I didn't completely articulate that, but I have this whole like map uh, places that I know everywhere I go geographically in my dreams is connected. It's like, like they're all part of this other world, right? And I don't know if you could literally get on a boat and go from this continent to this continent, but like they all exist in the same world, so to speak. And so like I have dream New Zealand and I have like dream China and I have dream Tahoe and I have dream Jacksonville. I have dream, uh, you know, Washington. I have all these places that like idealistically, uh, symbolically live in my dreamscape. And so like, I always, 
I always longed to go back to some of these places because they were so beautiful and enchanting having visited them in the dream. Uh, and yeah, I don't know, I don't know what that means, but it's, it's encouraging for some reason that like, you know, some dreams disappear and some dream, dreams come and go and you'll wake up and you'll be like, oh, that was sick. And then later that day, you can't really even remember it. And then other dreams, like I vividly still remember years and years, decades later. Um, and so I wonder what the difference is between those dreams that we hold on to and remember and we have like that IP address for versus the dreams that just fade in 12 hours or a day, you know? Uh, Cause there's, there's not too many in the middle where I like, kind of remember it's like either I remember that fucking dream that happened uh, the day after I broke up with this girlfriend when I was a freshman in college or, you know, I can't remember what I dreamt last night. I know I had dreams last night, but I can't remember. Them. Uh, so, you know, I'm fascinated by that. That's my, that's my spiel on REM sleep. That's interesting. And I, I think it's a perfect juxtaposition to the way that you speak with lackluster about the the woods like you obviously already like spoke about how magical the river is with with glitter but like i think the dreams are there for their for their inspiration to you it seems i don't know most, most everyday like waking experiences pale in comparison to the ones i have in my dreams why and i only say that not to not to like set you up like my intention is that i would argue like the idealized state is that the two are, 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 are on the same level, right? Because there's, yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, there's like, there's an intrinsic feeling that I come out of my dreams with that uh, fills me with a light or like an intangible feeling that I can't really generate uh, in real life. And I, bet, I bet you can a lot of times, okay, well, maybe you can. No, um, you, you, I bet you can. I'll wake up and I'll like long for uh, a reality where that can be tapped into and touched, um, but it's fleeting because it's part of the dreamscape and not part of the waking reality. Uh, and yeah, I haven't, I haven't found a means to like tap into that very often in my waking life. I mean, sure, like, there are moments when I'm like powder snowboarding when it definitely comes close. But again, we're talking about like the idealized version of an experience. Um, and that's very hard to create in this life. And yeah, I mean, we get, we go back to talking about expectations and experiences. I'm just trying to communicate to you. I hear you. People feeling that I have uh, from dreaming and how it's hard reality for me often falls short. Yeah, I think, I mean, the reason why I, I press you on it is I think that that is, 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 is the crux of a really deep thing that, that is, worth, is worth delving into, only because I think it could, it could improve your experiences. Well, with, here's the caveat. My dreams are largely responsible for all of the cool things that I've done in my life. So, uh, you know, when I was in my teens and early 20s, I dreamt about traveling to tropical places and snorkeling and scuba diving. So to chase those images, that imagery and those, ex those dream experiences, I went and had those experiences in real life. And some of them came close to what I experienced in the dreamscape. When I was living in China teaching English, I had repeated dreams about, and this was dead on, like uh, moving to Tahoe and uh, winter not coming to Tahoe <laughs> and then having to move somewhere else to a better place where there was winter. And that's exactly how that future played out. I moved to Tahoe for two years when I came home from China, uh, guessing my dreams were incorrect. And sure enough, we had two terrible winters back to back. And then I moved to Jackson and it was like a life changing experience. And I started a new career and all that stuff. So like, while we can on the one hand say, oh, like what sounds to you like I'm just poor me and victimizing myself and saying like, oh, well, it's never as cool as it feels in the dream. That's not really what I'm saying. What I'm saying is like the ideal exists in the dream and those ideals inspire me to manifest uh, 
beautiful, wonderful experiences in my waking reality. But that doesn't mean that they're ever going to touch the perfection that can exist in the dreamscape. You know, it doesn't mean they suck. Like, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. That's interesting. Life is really cool, but it's not, yeah. it's never going to be the ideal because it's real life. It's not, it's not a dream. That's it. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, the Hindus believe it's a dream. Oh, our, well, yeah, I mean, we go, we get into like simulation. I, I don't, I don't know that. I just been listening to Alan Watts <laughs> and he says that shit and, and, and it, it, it makes sense. It's like, he has this thing. So I've been listening to Akira the Don. He's a guy on YouTube and he makes, have you heard of that? Actually, I gotta, hold on. I, I have to break in here. Go ahead. Uh, Cause you just reminded me of this. So the other night, this was fucked up. What? The other night, and this is just an interesting story, but like, I don't know what we're going to get from this. The other night, you know, it reminded me of Inception, but I had a dream inside of a dream, uh, like inside of a dream. I, I, I don't recall if it was the second or third degree, but like, so I was in the dream and so I was dreaming and I, I got that much. I was walking around and I saw myself not in my bed, but I saw myself in the dream sleeping. Whoa. Um, and so I walked up to Sam, who's sleeping in the dream, first degree of the dream, and I like shake Sam awake, and then I instantly pop into that Sam waking up. But I'm still dreaming, like in now in the secondary. <laughs> so like, but then I thought I was awake, but I was still in that first degree. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. You know what I'm saying? I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. So like the 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 first consciousness vanished because I had woken myself up uh from the second layer. And then I like popped into that perspective and I was like on my back sitting up. I'm like, oh now I'm awake. But I was still one degree deep. Right. Uh or three. I don't you know what I mean? It's like a weird <laughs> right. Right. Well, I mean, haven't you ever heard that voice? I've had that. I've told myself that I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. And then the next day at, at 5.59, I, I very distinctly hear a voice in my head say, wake your ass up, Devin, it's 6 o'clock. Yeah. And it's like, who the fuck is that? Mm -hmm. It's me. For yeah. sure. It's, for sure it's me. Your subconscious. Well, but it's like a super ordinate system. It's a system that's aware of everything happening. And it's, it's I, like, I, you can access that. Yeah. Um, and that's a fucking trip. Um, yeah, I think- you realize you're accessing it. I'm, I mean, maybe you can, I don't know. Like, I, I, I am intrigued with, with philosophies and, and, and systems of thought that integrate the magic of life. Because there's clearly exponent, like, you know, in no, like am amazing amounts of information about the human condition that we don't understand. And the thing that's so fucking pompous about the Western worldview is that we all, we, everything we know, we know everything, we know what everything's made of. So we know how to manipulate everything. And anybody who's ever done even the slightest amount of introspection knows that that's bullshit. We mm -hmm. don't know everything. We don't understand our own deepest intentions, our own deepest thoughts. And even to do that for a moment is like, Oh, it's like a touching God, you know, it's, it's, it's next level. And anybody it's, it's wonderful, right? You've done mushrooms. Like, you know what it is, you know, like never. to have never, right. To have those feelings of transcendence really give you a picture of, of what reality really is. And it's way too much to bring back to, you know, having breakfast at the office. But like, I am our universe started. I'll tell you right now. Tell me, I'm interested. Let's hear it. I love how we were going to end this conversation. Um, so I have this theory. Yeah, let's hear it. I pitched this to one or two cosmologists. You know cosmologists? What I fucking cosmologists do you know? I always shoot it down with like one or, two, <laughs> one or two in the weeds reasons why bullshit. Okay. They're just, their math is wrong or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no mathematics on this theory yeah yeah wish i'm telling me but i think the way it break down was like i mean it's essentially multiverse theory right so 
what happened is what we refer to as like the big bang yeah right um you know the big bang stemmed from a singularity blowing the fuck up right mm. um or not blowing up but starting expansion there's nothing to blow up into yeah, but okay. but what that tells me is like the only other like you know point in the universe where we know that singularities exist are black holes right so what that tells me is that our big bang was just you know our universe is probably just the other side of a black hole that that you know a massive collapsing star about maybe 15 you know 14 13 15 billion years ago that just compressed down into a big old fucking black hole who knows how big um and we blew out the other side or you know we're all inside of a black hole. That's, that is our universe. And that would explain cosmic inflation because the black hole continues to pull dark matter and dark energy into our universe, right? So that makes, you know, it's like, it's like filling a right. balloon there. That right. makes the universe, what we perceive as our universe continue to expand because it's filling okay. with this other fucking dimension, dark, right here, yeah. dark energy. Um, but what the, the, the truly terrifying thought, uh, reality of that is like, if that's true, that means it really is infinity. And that if this is just one universe, every one of these black holes has another universe behind it. And then that universe has a shit ton of black holes in it. And each one of those black holes has a universe in it. And each one of those universes has a shit ton of black holes in it. And it's like, right. If, if we really so fra fractal, huh? Yeah, I think that's the deal. I think we just live in this massive fractal. And what does that mean? Does that mean like how many orders of magnitude above us are there? How small are we? Yeah, must like, must be infinite. On this like spatial plane is like kind of in the middle, but like, what if we're? I mean, like we are really small cosmologically, but what if we're like? really small <laughs> well well i think i think i think the way to approach the idea of us is that the material and the spiritual are inextricably or rather or rather uh like fundamentally of different essences so when you talk about scale in terms of material you can't talk about us in the same scale because we we we're we are being channeled through the material realm like what you what what is coming out of you in terms of the creativity and insight and thoughts and feelings is not just your neurology and biochemistry. I don't buy that. I'm not a materialist. I don't think you can reduce the self down to tissue and cells. I just don't think that that's how it works. I think there's an innate magic to life, and that magic is something that nobody can can understand, but people can uh, can feel it. And anybody who's genuinely felt themselves like Mac Dre creates art or great insight and pushes the whole species forward because that magic is so quantum beyond anything that can be written down or communicated effectively that to like commune with it makes you great if you can like give it to other people. And so, I'm sorry, I'm just saying, so that gives me like peace of mind when I start thinking about like the cosmology problem or like the, 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 the problem of like astrophysics because it's just like, you, you can't get to life from chemistry. Like we try and, 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 you know, it makes sense that, you know, lightning struck a, you know, fucking pool of carbon or whatever the fuck is the, is the, is the, is the thought. But like at a certain point you just get to nonsense. And, and that's where I get interested is like, let's talk about the nonsense. Let's talk about the dreams. Let's talk about feelings. Let's talk about the things that make no sense on paper because everybody understands them, everybody feels them. And we can build all of these mental maps. Like, it's interesting that you talk about your theory of Big Bang, because I've legitimately had the exact same thought, but slightly different, or rather a, a very similar thought. And that is the way that makes sense to me in terms of all interaction and like the ether in which I think I, I operate and everybody else operates, because I'm of the opinion that like Gaia hypothesis, I think is a fair, assertion the earth is conscious and we're just one little action potential in the neurons firing between place and place like we're just a constituent element of this larger being 
that's, that's, that, you know, and that makes perfect sense to me because I feel like when I'm in the flow of, of her, if you like, I'm a higher expression of myself. I'm like more effective, but by extension, like you're talking about like the pulling in of, of, of a great, you know, collapsing star into a black hole and then, and then the big bang. I think, I, I think it's a fair assertion to, to posit that every star and every black hole are, are connected like at terminal points. That is to say like the universe recycles. I think where things get pulled in, they go out somewhere else in the very same way that we're animated by this weird concept of like, we're hollow, right? Like you look in the, in the, in the center of my eyes, there's nothing there. Like I, I, may, I may have this whole story about myself and my, and my place in the world and my stature and stuff, but the center of my eye is blackness. And, and if you go into my mouth or my nose, where does it take you? It's out of my butt. Like it's, it's, I'm, I'm hot. We're all hot. We're just built around everything, you know? And so the thing that trips me out is this idea of, of in and out and, and giving and receiving and mm -hmm. like, and like gazing and then like perceiving, like it's always this interplay of, of yin and yang and in and out. And I think that the universe works that way. I think that, Everything that's expanding is equally balanced by things that are being constricted and contracted. There's, there's, and I've heard this. There's a, there's a brilliant guy that lived in the same time as Nikola Tesla. Uh, I think, I think it was Manley P. Hall, but it might be somebody else. But he wrote a book called The Universal One, and the, and the, and the, and, and I won't keep going. But the anecdote that Tesla supposedly told him is, dude, you got to lock this book up for a thousand years until people are ready for it. But there's some little, there's, there's pages from it that are published, and you can buy the book, and he equates radiation with gravitation, that they're opposites. And that those are the two fundamental cosmic forces, that things are either pulling into form or dissipating out into expression. Like those are the two. I think your wife is knocking on your door. No, my wife's right there. Somebody else is knocking on the door. What's up? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. I did that. My bad, babe. <laughs> My wife's pissed at me. We didn't finish our laundry. Yeah, uh, I gotta go. Yeah. Well, bro, very fun speaking with That's you. Conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's do it again. And uh, let's do it. No, yeah. Let's let's uh, put another one on the books. And uh, if you can remember, text me the name of that book. I'm fascinated. The universal one, I will text you right now before I go to bed. Love you, bud. Glad to see you doing yeah. well. Yeah. Stay up. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go to sleep as well, do. Uh, you know, metaphorically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, great combo. I'll talk to you soon. All right, brother. Good night. Good night. All right, I just stopped recording. I'm going to end the meeting. Sweet dreams, my man. All right, dude. Have a good night. Peace.